cool man um well yeah do you would you like to um give us a little bit of an overview on who you are whilst we're still waiting for people to come on yeah sure uh, well i'm i'm bjorn i am still 39 years old for <laughs> another month to go um and I work in video games primarily. I also do short films and commercials and stuff, but primarily video games, mainly because I like the interactive element there is to it. Um, just wrapped up a game that's coming out in a month or two called The Ascent for Xbox. And I am, I have just joined a team working on a really nice big, uh, not very not very, let's say, commercially presented yet, uh, MMO, which is real nice, um, where I'm the audio lead, which is my first lead title, which is great. Um, uh, yeah, and apart from that, I work from home like most other people do these days, um, which means that I never, practically never leave the studio. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's about it. Now I'm work now, and then I am helping out uh, Ubisoft in Germany at the moment, working on the new Settlers game too. So that's oh, cre cre creaky wheels and forests <laughs> and wind, <laughs> quite a lot. Excellent. So I mean, the last time we saw you, um, you just sort of finished up that dark game, Dark with the Q. Yeah. Um, and you were working on a project that you weren't at liberty to discuss at the time. Yeah, I don't. To discuss that uh, now. I, I actually don't remember which one was the secret one. I think it might have been Cyberpunk. It could be. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I did work on Cyberpunk 2077 right around that time. Uh, I don't recall. I maybe recall that 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 the whole thing was that I wasn't allowed to talk about it as such. I could say that I was working there, but couldn't say that I uh, did it, whatever I did on it. Yeah. Uh, and then, I mean, after finishing up dark back then, that was, that was really excellent because that was a very, not a high profile project, but from a sound perspective, it was really high profile uh, and had a lot of creative freedom um, did some really cool stuff and, and decided that I want to make the first real and actual subwoofer friendly video game. Um, <laughs> yeah, I downloaded it and had a go on it um, after after you came in uh, um, and played it on headphones and then played it through a pair of Adam uh, monitor speakers. Nice. And every time you do the switch from perspective, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was that was so funny because it's it's um, the production thing of that game is, is really strange uh it's not unprofessional in any way but there was one guy working on it when you only have one guy there's there's so many things that that you don't need like version control software you don't need to upload anything you don't need any way of, of dealing with projects between people so working on it was not a nightmare, but I had to do stuff and then send it to him and then literally like cross my fingers and be like, just be good. Because <laughs> I had no way of changing stuff after I sent it to him. Um, but it turned out all right. Yeah. I, I even won an award for it, which was I was really excited oh, yeah. about. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> I was really excited about that. Like a little boy, I sat home with my dad at my house and be like, oh, it's an award show up against call of duty and stuff <laughs> <laughs> well deserved i'd say well deserved thank you um so um if you don't mind let's start working through these questions that sure so um we'll sort of start off with your sort of background a little bit um in regards to sort of what did you study initially um, uh at first i actually didn't study anything like i have a it's a bit different but like most sound designers, I started out as a musician because that was that's your access point, you can say. Yeah. Um, but I started to study because I was trying to get into the industry back in that ah, late 90s, early 2000 ish, when I wasn't very old and there was no way I was going to get a job because I was so in inexperienced. But um, 
I remember having some applications out and some of the very few, not interviews, but responses I got for for internships or junior positions was with Atari and a couple of other places. And some of them sort of like took it a little further. And one, I think it was Atari, that wrote back and said, like, do you have a degree uh, and stuff like that? Um, I s- strongly don't believe that you necessarily, you don't necessarily need the degree, you know, the paper. The whole question is, what did you learn while you were at school? Because paper itself isn't really showing anything. Um, but then I started to have an interest in trying to get a degree because if that was what was holding me between applying for a job and actually landing a job, then I needed the degree. So um, yeah. then I applied for many years at the Conservatory of Music. They have this electronic composition course here, which is it depends on who you ask, but some people find it very prestigious. I, I, it's just because there are so few people that get in. It's not like the school is prestigious in itself. Um, but got in eventually. It was, I was a bit surprised, but I got in and then studied electronic music for a while. <coughs> um, finished the bachelor's, the BA there went on to do the master's program. But I also found out that, that, um, I could do a second master at the same time in so-called audio design, which is more of an academic approach to audio design. Uh, more like, you know, from a theoretical academic perspective, discussing why does stuff sound the way it does? Not really, why is it good or anything like that? Um, you delve into the effects of sound on people. Is this the sort of point where you started considering game audio as a career? Yeah, I mean, I wanted to do game audio, but I also wanted to do film or anything like that. And 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 without a doubt, if 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 my first real job had been in the film industry, I would have probably gone that way. Yeah. Like like I just wanted to do sound, like yeah. mainly game audio. But if it was film, okay, I can do film. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but so so what I did to study and to learn was literally just to find out what is easily uh, accessible to work on. And in Denmark, we have this really gigantic short film industry where a lot of people, uh, it's not working for free, but everybody like gets together in groups and makes short films because everybody needs it for their application at film school. So the director needs a guy who can be a photographer, then they work together and they both use the applica- use it for their application. And for some reason, there's hardly any sound guys there. So I worked on like 50 of those, yeah. um, just, just recording stuff and so on. And eventually, it's not that they're all good, but, but eventually, like for every time we went on a recording thing, I learned a little thing or two. Yeah. And I would consider that it's, it's not that it's bad to go to school, but since I wasn't studying game audio at all during my studies, I do strongly believe that it was more the general classes that I learned the most from and then from personal experience that really made the trick. Yeah. Okay. So how did you sort of get started? What was your sort of first game work- job then, game audio job? I worked on some, I worked on like, uh, like as anyone should, I sent, I think I sent an email to literally every company on the planet just saying, I, I want to do this. I, uh, I don't encourage people to do so, but uh, I told them I can do this for literally no money. I, I can even not work, but just look over your shoulder just to see how it works. I can bring you coffee. I don't care. Um, and they all said no, as they do. And uh, later in my career, I also found out why. That's another thing. Um, but eventually, after having success with just a few projects and some school projects and so, kind of like like the most uh, stereotype sound designer, I guess, having one or two school projects and having made one small app or something for a friend, kind of, then I landed an internship at CCP to work on EVE Online. And 
that really kicked things off because as soon as I had that internship, then every job application I would send afterwards started to get responses. Oh. And it was really weird because that was companies I had applied to a year before completely ignoring me. And now that I could say, oh, I actually worked for six months on something, something that then yeah. you're all like, then <laughs> they really want to hire you. I don't know why. Um, I know it's the uh, poster in the background as well. E. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. it's a uh, it's a mag it's a PC gamer magazine front cover yeah. of a game we did. Uh, <laughs> that was <clears throat> I don't know. It's my wall. It's my ego wall trying yeah. to show show off. <laughs> so now every day when I'm home alone, I look at it and be like, oh, at least I did this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this sort of leads on to uh, the next question that somebody submitted. Uh, could you tell us in detail? The process of landing positions with AAA developers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, one of the things is that um, uh, okay, I truly understand why they don't hire just anyone, even if you want to work for free. But that and that is that is not because you are bad or your application is bad. It's just that they. You don't have to be in the industry very long until you find out that there's probably a thousand people who want the job and you really don't have time for uh, a, a student that you can have as a mentee towards something like you really have to to work autonomously. And we have all tried. I've also seen it happen where someone is hired and being given the chance who doesn't deliver. And then it's a waste of time for everybody. Uh, not that I don't believe in giving people the chance. It's just that there isn't time for that in AAA or with it, most studios at all. Um, so landing a job within AAA, the really important part is to, of course, send an application, but having a reel that backs up all your skills. And if you don't have a reel, then you have to make one. Just I don't care how you do it. Just, just make one. Um, look up some look up some of those uh, stupid LinkedIn articles, which are about how to write a cover letter. I know it sounds super weird, but they have all these, just instead of using this word, maybe use this word or stuff like that. And it seems like common sense, but it's, well, once you once you get that and you start to write a proper cover letter, then, then you might actually get a professional response from someone. Um, you have to realize that that the first person reading your application, and even if it's an open application, which is the worst, um, it's probably someone from HR who doesn't care about sound at all. And to get past an HR person is a game of itself. Sort of like a box ticking exercise. Yeah, so, so name drop all the things you need to name drop and sound interesting, right? Okay, but that's this is true, but write an application, like ignore your own ego, write an application as the most selfish dick, in e e like the most arrogant selfish dick you can imagine, write that and then rewrite the phrases so it doesn't come across as you being an ass. <laughs> Pardon my French. Um, <laughs> Uh, and re re rewrite the lines so that that you don't, of course, use any swear words or sound overly overly selfish or anything like that. But you really have to learn that what you have done and what you have achieved is a good thing. You don't you don't want to sound like you're oh I I worked on two projects in my bedroom that was meh. You know, <laughs> I've seen applications like that, but they really they really they really talk their own projects down because they don't believe in them and as much as they are any good you can't justify um having a meeting with a person who doesn't say i worked on two projects and it was awesome and we went through a pipeline thing and we were even if you're just three people or one person um so, so you have to like put your ego aside and write something really really over the top selfish just just be o overly american <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah like when writing it and then hope for the best because it's you're you're up against people who write like that and 
you know, as as they say, squeaky wheels gets oil first or something, isn't it what they say? <laughs> and it, it, if if you're the one who makes the most noise, then you will be noticed more. Um, well, I really confidence in your projects, really, and <clears throat> having some something under your belt. Like, like what? Saying, like you having some sort of projects that you've worked on in order to get into the sort of yeah, yeah like, you know like it's got a yeah and 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 understand that the fact that you worked on a project even though it's crap and didn't turn out to be any good or anything like that don't don't uh present it as okay this project was bad like maybe it was a learning experience we went through we went from from planning to production came up with a project that wasn't any good, so we scrapped it. But you don't have to necessarily say that. You just have to say that you went through a full production cycle and everything went fine. And you managed to, let's say, set audio direction, produce all the content and implement it. That, that, that's then the nobody, whole yeah. yeah, that's the whole process. You went through the process and you're not, you're not trying to to like th like don't be don't be scared of that you're writing to your audio hero. Like if I okay maybe if I was writing to Bethesda talking to Mark Lambert I'd be really scared. But 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 don't don't worry about writing to these people even if you like the games that they do like you have to really show off that you 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 bring something to the table that they can use. Uh, it can be a little tricky to write uh, applications like that. As, uh, even also for me, like I don't like this overly arrogant way of doing it. But but just it's noise, just just, it? It just just ignore that for a moment and write it yeah. and then send it and then just just <laughs> reassure like, yourself reassure yeah. yourself that that you are not that person in real life. I guess these things get a little bit easier through practice. Um, yeah. And yeah. To, I guess you've got to be quite thick skinned in regards to getting rejected for applications yeah. a lot and not, not let it sort of get you down and just keep trying, really. Yeah. Yeah. You, you just have to keep trying. I mean, uh, even if a company doesn't reply or anything like that, don't, don't take it as a, as a Perfect. no. It's as a no or as a complete rejection. You, you, um, like you, you don't have to, to worry about, that they, um, it's not because they don't like you. Maybe they really don't have a position for you mm. uh, and they can't invent it. They can't invent one for you, you know? So, I mean, it's like you were saying before, you were applying for companies. They said no. And then as soon as you'd worked on a project. Yeah, suddenly they, the oh, so then they, oh, oh, EA loves me now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, no, they don't. But I remember, I remember applying to some positions at EA and being completely ignored. And then having been at that internship at CCP, but that was like after a month or something, right before CCP hired me themselves, uh, which I was, that was lucky and fortunate for me. Um, but right before that happened, of course, I was already at that time looking forward to what I'm going to do after the internship at CCP doesn't hire me. And I remember, like, not all, but more than half of the applications I was sending out was suddenly getting interviewed. It was getting responses. Uh, oh, your profile is interesting, was what they were usually saying. We would like <laughs> to talk to you and so on. And they never said that before. I don't know why I'm all of a sudden so interesting back then. But it, it's a process and it happens. And the story about having a foot in the door and then it's, oh, you'll be all right, is really true. Uh, cool. Unless, of course, you burn down the building or something. Like that. <laughs> uh, awesome. That's, that's some really great advice. Um, sort of last sort of question on background in regards to you. So, um, was it sort of more of an interesting sound or an interesting video games that sort of given you the most sort of continue down this path? Or was mm. it something else altogether? Oh, I remember when I was making music, uh, I was uh, I was fortunate enough to do well with the music. That's, uh, that's a start. Um, but I remember, uh, like. Like if you tell your parents, you have probably all experienced that you say, oh, I'm, I'm studying video game audio. And they go like, you, is that a job? 
like is, does that is that a thing like and yeah it is i even still meet people today who ask me what i do and i tell them what i do and they go oh so you, you can make a living off that like like yeah. what is that real <laughs> yeah um and and to get back to it then then um i remember making music i i'm not a good composer at all um and I was more interested in making sounds for the electronic music that I was doing than actual uh, compositions. But then I heard about Hitman, the first Hitman game, because that was a big deal here in Denmark. I didn't know. But then already then there were talks about now there is a studio in Copenhagen that's making video games. There's a studio that they have a I think it was in the article. They have a sound guy. They have an animator. They have all these professions. And I remember reading it and be like, why? Like, why isn't this what I do? Like, like, uh, take all my musical sound design skills and put them to good use. Because I myself was in a situation where I was thinking, okay, if it's, it's going to be techno or nothing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and and since I wasn't a good composer, then it might not be techno. Um, I do remember some pictures that you had in your uh, sort of oh, presentation yeah? last time. You had like a Mohican yeah, yeah, on yeah. stage with the, all the hardware and stuff. Weird, weird hair and techno, ultraviolet clothing stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's me. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the the funny part was more that. And that was when I realized, oh, there, there is more to this. Maybe I'm not that bad at something. Uh, and then I started, I was very shy back then. So I did not write an application to IO Interactive, which I totally should have back in 2001. Uh, and I started to try and learn, but didn't send any applications. And then when I felt good enough, I started writing applications to some companies uh, and later when I joined, uh, I actually joined IO Interactive for 2012, 14, something like that, um, uh, 14 maybe. And then uh, I remember talking to one of the old sound designers and he was like, oh, can we hear some of your old stuff? And I showed them what I had done back in 99 and 2000. And they were like, oh, wow. If you had sent this back then, we would have probably hired you. It's like, fuck. Oh, like, I have to say that. Here, here I am 14 <laughs> years later and, and really struggled, almost gave up. And so, of course, they probably wouldn't have hired me. That, that's an easy thing for him to say. But that proves the point that, that you have to apply. If I could go back to my former self back then, I would probably just tell myself, like, like just, just keep at it and apply like you you might even be lucky that you the, the you know you, you end up in the lucky bucket when you send an application maybe you are sending an application specifically in that 5 minute time frame where someone is looking at their inbox going oh we need a sound this sa oh there's one um <laughs> and then they hire people it's not always about being the best and so on there's a huge portion of luck and timing involved in it um yeah, it's a good thing to bear in mind when you're approaching these. Sort of yeah, things. and and also have in mind that the person after the HR person, the sound designer, who might read your application, they're they're not professional recruiters. So so also the fact that you just had to go through the professional HR person who's super strict, then the sound design guy might be looking for something completely different, um, and their social skills might be zero um so it can be re it can be really hard you really have to hit that like nail it on a good day because as most other creative people if that sound designer is more interested in making drum patterns that day he he just has to read applications and doesn't care then none of those people will do any get the job at all well excellent um cool so just we're gonna sort of move on to some of your creative process that's all right you're sort of touching on, you sort of spoke about how you preferred to make sounds when you were making music and stuff. Yeah. In regards to sort of recording sounds, um, do you have, I, can't, I, I sort of know this, the answer from this from the last time um, I saw you, but do you have particular uses for the sounds when you go out and when you're recording sounds? Um, for example, like uh, an impact for a transition um, or 
you know, do you do you do you purely recording sessions and then find uses for them later? Uh, both, but um, my my preferred approach is just to go out and record cool stuff and then give it a name, put it into some editor and do stuff to it and then make a thousand files and then name those, you know, like um, Ball Crusher, Boom Bang, of uh, uh, evil evil spaceship from mars planet to something just give it some nicknames and so on and then eventually um later when i then need a sound uh one of those sounds might be what i need um yeah. or it could be this one sound combined with this one will do something for me um but I do also go out sometimes, uh, okay, I need branches that break and I can sit in a library and look for branches that break for a couple of hours and maybe not find the right branch that sounds the right way. But I know that if I just walk down to the park with a microphone, I can record one in two seconds. Um, so it's the creative process can be, I mean, libraries and, and library stock material sounds can save you a lot of time but it's also very limited because they don't have every variation, which mm. is impossible. Um, so sort of like creating your own library, if you find out, oh, this place has cool wood stuff that can break, then you've recalled co cool wood stuff, even if you don't need cool wood stuff. But you never know. Then in a month or two, there might be a small project where some guy is walking on specifically types of wood and then you need it. Um, so it's more like um, thinking uh, ahead creatively, maybe. Sure, yeah. Uh, Do you use any sort of um, applications to organize these audio files, or is it just sort of naming conventions or sort of tonal and textual folders? Uh, sort of like you say, sort of like yeah, sci-fi sounds. I have two. I have two folders. One is all the libraries that I bought and have from other people. And then I have one library, which is just all Bjorn's stuff, it's called. <laughs> <laughs> and just packed with files of everything. And they're, they're seriously named um, uh, Wooden Ball Roll and then underscore maybe some variation, Spaceship Boom or stuff like that. The reason why they're named, all these stupid names, is that, that they are named in the way that I know that I would also search for them. So if I'm looking for a sound that in my head should be named, you know, epic warm spaceship, yeah. then those would be the terms I would also use when I look for them. And then it finds my files because um, if this was for a professional library, I would name them completely different. Yeah. Um, but since I need to, because I have from experience tried to record something cool and then not name the files. Then they were just called track one, two, three, four, five, whatever. And then eventually you find out you have like a billion folders with track one and two and three and four and five, and then you have to go through them all. So naming conventions is 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 uh, not a strict one, but it's key to going over it all the time. So excellent. I mean, I've definitely been there with uh, stuff. I, I took one approach of trying to name things. Yeah you know professionally and then like to say in my mind it's like that that crazy glass that rolled and then fell off the floor that sort of went the gunk yeah. so i'm searching for glass rolling and it wasn't it was like you know track uh you know or what <laughs> it's like completely and you sort of just get lost in these things and i think like it's a personal a combination of sort of personal approach and naming convention isn't it yeah and I'm also sure. not not necessarily named after what it is yeah so so glass breaking if you record it in a certain way where it doesn't anymore sound like glass breaking it could be i don't know t t tiny tiny bones breaking or something yeah. like 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 what what you think it might be used for um Text okay. yeah um uh, and then just find it again and yeah. use it yeah. <laughs> so do you you obviously go out and you record some stuff as well um, and obviously, you know, you've spoken about doing some synthesis and stuff uh, back in the day. Um, what sort of ratios do you reckon would you use in regards to, you know, say a project? Obviously, it depends on the project, but 
physically recorded sounds or synthesized sounds yourself um and sort of like what 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 ratios would you use on average i guess between on, on For, an average project like synthesize more sounds than recording or do you use a combination of the both uh, it's it's always a combination but i'm a big um i'm a big fan of not not libraries as in library stuff but i'm a big fan of sampling and manipulation i don't use synths very much not that i don't like synths or anything like that but i'm more of a uh, happy accident type of guy uh where i know and have in mind that happy accidents happen from knowing your tools of course they can happen from actual accidents but I know what this tool does. If I do fiddly fiddly with it and then combine it with something else, maybe something comes out. So I like to just manipulate samples to death and then uh, sometimes something which is aesthetically pleasing comes out of it. Yeah. Uh, Collect those as well. So you've got sort of like, you know, a library of these all sort of like mashed up. Yeah. And And one of my favorite things to do is batch process stuff. I've talked about that before. I even think I talked about it last week. It doesn't matter. Uh, like batch process stuff, like finding finding something that batch processes well in terms of uh, if this is um, uh, that's what's it called Col- convolution reverb thing. Maybe you have a plugin and then you add something. Uh, one of, one of my favorite things that I ever made was uh, for for Eve, which is this motocross race track thing (laughs) with uh, driving across a really gritty sound. And I found out that, that if I use that as the, as a deconvolved uh, reverb and then just send long drones through it, then I get drones that sound like the drone, but now moving like the racetrack. Um, And that became, I think, well, that is literally the background noise of the space stations in Eve, who's like whoa, whoa, in and out. But that's maybe a couple of hundred files that went through that process, and maybe ten of them was useful at all. <laughs> and, and and then they sounded oh, all right. Yeah. So so it's it's uh, it's quite important that don't don't. Don't think that every sound that you produce is going to be great. Kind of like if you're making music, not every track's going to be the next hit. You know? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I mean, uh, so how does uh, your approach differ depending on whether it's sort of like a personal project or a commissioned one? Um, it's about working, you know, you've worked on things like Hitman, quite big AAA things, and then you've worked yeah. on smaller things, like you were saying, with a dark game. Um, how does your approach you feel sort of differ? Uh, it's pretty much the same, really. Yeah. Uh, in triple A, uh, when you have to do footsteps uh, or something, then of course, uh, as you must understand, sound design is a craft. Uh, so, so then you know the craftsman sort of like takes over. Okay, now I have to. Uh, not boring, but like use the most boring of all the skills, like my knowledge of microphones and stuff, uh, make some steps on a floorboard and record it. It's super ordinary. It doesn't feel very creative, but if you need it today for in the project, then that's how you're going to do it. You need to, that, that happens more often in AAA than it does in, in smaller projects that, we need a lot of content produced and you need to know how to make it. Uh, and, and when it comes to recording Foley, for example, like footsteps and so on, then there is the correct way of doing it. Uh, microphone placement and recording it correctly. And then there is the creative way where you're experimenting with close mics, distant mics and so on. But if you don't have time for it, then you have to be the professional and then just do it the most boring way you can imagine. Uh, and actually, usually that also produces the best result. Yeah, I remember you telling us a story about uh, literally recording some sounds on your mobile phone. Yeah, and obviously processing them, and then they ended up getting used. Yeah, that's uh, 
Yeah, I did that a couple of times. But even in even in cyberpunk, there are sounds like that where it's just, you know, a phone and then a backpack being thrown around because we needed yeah. a backpack sound really quick. It's not the best of recordings. We did manipulate it quite a bit, but that was more like that's what we have right now. So yeah. let's let's roll. You don't need. Okay, that's easy to say when you live in a Western country, but you don't need an expensive microphone. The microphone in the phone is actually pretty expensive, mm -hmm. but you don't need uh, super expensive gear. You need some basics uh, and then you can roll with it. Everything else is just fluff, like the reel to reel back there. That's yeah. pure fluff. <laughs> uh, and only just because it's fun, not because it does anything good. And I guess it's like you say, like learn how to use the tools that you've got to the best of their abilities. Um, yeah, and then one day when you need them, you will know exactly what to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I've got quite an interesting one here. Uh, what, what has distinguished you from anybody else? <laughs> uh, in the game audio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, in real life, it's different, but in game audio, um, I think... Um, I think I was lucky enough, especially with EVE Online, to join a team that needed my type of sound, uh, being a big fan of, of electronic music, glitchy production, and being very aggressive, and everything just compressed to death and then expanded some more and compressed some more. Um, and that fit very well. So I, I wouldn't call it necessarily luck because that my imposter syndrome thinks it's luck. But um, I think what distinguished me from others was that, that I was up against some, some people who were producing very, very pretty, nice sounds. And that wasn't needed at the time. So it's your sort of sonic aesthetic that you brought to the table that got noticed. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the audio director at CCP is a big fan of electronic music and, and uh, mm. weird, weird stuff and glitchy music and, you know, five hour drones and whatever you can produce. Um, and I had specifically made stuff like that. So so that sort of like hit the nail with him. And then afterwards, I don't know what distinguished me, but but it's the i'm i can be pretty shy and introverted but i still have some social skills that makes me come across as friendly i hope yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that, may, that might like at a party i come across as kind of friendly kind of talkative and so on um and that really helps too because that meant that we had some game audio get-togethers um I asked questions. People remember who asked the good questions and so on. Um, and in the long run, I mean, getting the job at IO Interactive after CCP was really um, because I years back had talked to the audio director and stuff like that. So, so that gave me, that gives me an advantage. Um, so a lot of the things that I back then didn't think meant anything suddenly meant that people remembered my face, they remembered my name, they remembered my sound and so on. So I made myself heard, oddly enough, when it's sound, but I made myself heard and people sort of remember that, which sort yeah. of makes people, okay, th this, is, this is an interesting character to hire at our team. And that, I guess, distinguished it a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm from other applicants as well. Um, Good talent, social skills and technical skills as well. Yeah, you don't, I, what I mean is that you don't have to be super social. You don't have to be some party animal because I'm right. not. <laughs> uh, but, but it's more about that, that if, you, if you're just a little bit friendly, if you're just a little bit social, if you're just, a, people remember you a little bit, just, it, it will come because people will remember you at one point. Um, and, and, and yeah, yeah, sure. I worked on some nice projects now, but it's still, to me, it still feels like yesterday that I was working somewhere com for nothing and so on. And it's not, all, all this didn't come easy, but it, as long as you just, I just kept working, I guess, 
Yeah. I, I remember studying with other people who literally expected, who had no, they had no experience. And when I was a student, I had some experience. They were literally expecting that when they would get out of school, there would be a job waiting for them. Mm. And that's, that's a very big, not a mistake, but a misunderstanding of how the industry works because um, that guy versus me or someone else who, who already had a small reel to show and uh, even if we didn't work on any projects, I had like 20 redesigned small videos that I had made and so on, um, which makes me come across as much more serious than others. And I, that might, from the batch of students that came out of my college and, and university, that, that, that may, might have mis made me come across as more professional in some way. Okay. Um, so reels yeah. and content is... Really important. Yeah, really cool. yeah, building building content and getting yeah. out there a bit. And, yeah, and don't don't yeah. on, don't yeah. underestimate your own content. I've yeah. been sitting there a thousand times thinking that this is shit, something that I was making, and then later to yeah. find out yeah. that yeah. other people like it, and yeah. I don't I don't get why they like it, but they do. Yeah, and yeah. and that's that's how it works. And don't yeah. don't. Don't it's hide classic. your material. So yeah, absolutely. It's a classic sort of quite creative thing, isn't it? Everybody's their own worst critic. Yeah, yeah. and then then people what you release, let's say one one track of music, and they all go, "Oh wow, what is this? This is great." Um, have you produced anything else? Yeah, a couple of thousand tracks, but I don't want you to hear them. And then <laughs> that that's not how you break it. That's that's you don't make it and break it through that. Like you don't you. You're supposed to put stuff out there. Um, yeah. Excellent. Um, cool. Just, yeah, a couple, couple more, really. Um, sure. Can you remember a problem that particularly annoyed you and how did you fix it on any project? Uh, yeah. Um, communicative issues with uh, other egos on a team. Oof. Like, uh, like too, too many chefs, too many creative people with opinions. Yeah. Sometimes you need to just pack it in and understand that I'm the junior and I will sit in my corner and do as I'm told. Not that you're not allowed to argue, but I've bumped into problems where um, it's not that I have the the answer to everything and my, that my ideas are better than others or anything like that, but bumped into issues where I had an opinion about something that was completely ignored mainly because we had a director who would only accept ideas coming from him. And then he went to GDC and saw a talk from some people at DICE and comes back with a presentation of what he thinks we need for the game. And what he's talking about is literally the same as the design document that me and a colleague made about what we thought would be best for the game. And he presented it as is, this is what he brought home from GDC. This was his idea. Like, hey, we said this two years ago. And, and that, that causes, let's call it personality issues. <laughs> yeah, I <like> bet. <laughs> uh, it can be really difficult um, if you don't know your place on both sides of the table. Because I, I, I also understand him uh, not wanting other people to have opinions since he's hired to have opinions and ideas. And I'm just there to do craftsmanship and footsteps and ambient sounds. Um, but that that can really become a problem if you're if you're an outspoken type of person. If there are two outspoken people at a team and their opinions clash, that causes serious issues. <laughs> um, but not only from a personality perspective, but also from a technical perspective. If you have the solution to the problem that you're sitting with, um, like we have a video game and maybe someone isn't interested in making it sound ace. They just want to make it sound okay. And you have like, uh, let's call it different opinions on what level of game we're making. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that bothers me a little bit because, well, that, that can become a problem because if, if you want to make something that you think is triple A and that is miles above what other people think is triple A, then you clash because then you may do systems that are too complicated or too advanced for how they want things to be. So you have to sacrifice some things, create. Yeah, them. swallow your pride. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, I had that happen a couple of times. And now that I'm audio lead, I don't have to bother with that anymore because <laughs> now I'm the guy with the ideas and all the others because my team is only me, so I can just do whatever I want. Uh, right. And that, that makes it a lot more fun. But that, that means that that if you... That's another reason why some people don't get hired. If, what's it called? Too many chefs in the kitchen? Yeah, yeah like... Well, like <laughs> yeah. Nobody wants to. Nobody wants to hire an if they already have a rock star developer, like a rock star audio director. They don't want to hire a rock star senior guy, because that that will be, that will if they can't work together, it will cause issues. Um, <laughs> and I've tried that a couple of times. Um, it's a really <laughs> big production issue. Just out of interest, you just mentioned the audio leads now, but obviously you come from like you were speaking before, like junior positions and stuff like that. Yeah. What sort of uh, what the sort of main differences apart from? Well, it sort of sounds like being sort of like front line on the front line, and then being sort of like the, being the lead. Would be like say you make the decisions, and you just sort of make sure that those decisions are being carried out creatively. Yeah, but as as the lead, if I had a team, it of course it, I would be leading the team. But right now, I'm just the lead of myself. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> trying to find my way. Um, <laughs> but then, um, uh, what I do right now is that I haven't, I haven't made a single sound in two or three months. Because all I've been doing is sitting in Wise and in Unreal Engine and trying to design systems that I know will work so that when we make content, it will just be the click of a button and add it, and then it will work. So right now, I'm more interested in the creative process of, oh, when we go from this area to this area, how shall the logic behave? And yes, that is sound design, even if I'm not doing any sound, because in my head, I know how it's going to be. But as a lead, I'm trying to design all those systems, and Very then we will, cool. and then we will hire some junior guy who can get to do all the content. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we need fifty billion footsteps. Go ahead, yeah. <laughs> and like, no, nah, just um, but that's that's the main difference. That now I get to design systems. Uh, also, because this is a new project that is being made from scratch, um, and sometimes when you work on bigger projects where you join them, maybe there are systems already, uh, kind of like the ones that I'm designing. There are systems already and you can't change them. Uh, so then it's just content production and may maybe creative use of the tools. That's, that's yeah. possible, but, but you have to stick to with what, what you're given. Yeah. Uh, another problem, by the way, from the previous question that you bump into is sometimes how things are meant to be done in combination with this you join a company and they have a way of doing things and then let's say you have to replace all the ambient sounds in an area doing it one way but you already know that the programmer is working on a tool that will make it more efficient and easier and automated later then but you still have to do it because you need it for the demo which is in a month and then you make all the content, you set it up, you spend hours on doing it and so on. And then you go, yay, it's done. And they show the demo, everything is great. And then they scrap the system and you have to redo it again. <laughs> uh, that is extremely frustrating. Heartbreaking. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Especially if they, even if they, like, I've, I've also seen that where they, and that's also swallowing my pride, but but in, in certain video games, you, you make a level that is only meant for a vertical slice in a demo. And then you put it out. And then immediately after, you're being told, but that scene won't be in the game. But I just worked on it six months. They're like, yeah, but it won't be in the game. 
Oh. And, oh, okay, I will go grab some coffee and yeah. ignore <laughs> that my work is wasted. Um, I mean, it's a similar sort of thing when sort of, you know, collecting assets and doing audio design for projects is that you, I guess it's better to sort of overcompensate and then not use some of it. Obviously, this is slightly different if you're putting loads of work into a piece. It then gets used as some sort of sort of demo or a system, and then <laughs> it gets scrapped. Yeah, but That's but when, when you join a bigger project, same with swallowing your pride. That you have to understand that it's you are a sound designer. It's not your call. Mm. There might be a game director who has a completely different opinion from you, and you 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 can tell him your opinion, but it, <laughs> it might not be heard. Maybe they had other plans for quite a long time. Um, and it, it can be kind of odd to a, adapt to that sort of work environment. Yeah. But you have to. So yeah. Adaptability is a big, big thing. Absolutely. Cool. Um, so you mentioned, like, we've just been talking about you being audio lead and designing these systems and tools, essentially. Um, and then you say you might get in some sort of junior to do all the sound design. So... Yeah, uh, okay, maybe not a junior, but someone. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you're sort of looking to go through the sort of, you know, essentially yeah. hiring process. So what sort of things do you look for in a portfolio uh, when looking for sort of sound designers and stuff? And is there any sort of particular uh, applications or programs that you look for that you must have? Uh, yeah, if you, use, if you use Cubase, as I do, and... Wavelab as I do, and you like techno, then you win it. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I'm not a big fan of limitations in terms of what creative tools you're, you're using. Uh, yeah. I have worked in places where we were being told you can only use Pro Tools because that's what we use. And no offense to DigiDesign, but I really dislike Pro Tools um, for creative reasons, not for mixing and stuff. But, But... I've also worked at places where they asked me, what, what DAW do you want to use? And I was like, I, I use Cubase. Okay, we buy a license. Here, use Cubase. This guy uses Reaper. This guy uses Ableton. Okay, fair enough. Uh, each to one man's liking. But um, in an application, if it was sent to me in that regard, uh, I look for... A, a nice cover letter that is worded nicely. It doesn't have to be super crazy, but in the real, I like that you show actually that you show creative skills in terms of the real itself, like that you can do something that is completely over the top, overproduced, and then something quiet maybe, and then gunshots, footsteps, the, the whole shebang. Um, it doesn't have to be very long. But if it's if you have something weak and you can get rid of it, then do that. Yeah. Um, and it's really difficult to be on this side of the table because someone might send you something and they might be really good and the real might also show that they are really good. But because you're looking for someone who can make tree sounds, if, if there isn't tree sounds in your reel, but you actually have that somewhere else. And then someone sends a reel that fits perfectly to our game that gives them an unfair advantage. Let's put it like that. Sure, sure. Would you say, uh, that, you know, how much content is too much or too little in regards to a reel? Yeah. Uh, uh, a reel should be uh, a minute to a minute and a half long. Yeah. Uh, it's not very much, but that's the whole point. Uh, I would recommend everybody to watch um, uh, Kevin's show, Real Talk, on yeah. Twitch. Yeah. Um, he has great opinions on how to do things. And he also tells very honestly, we are currently watching this reel. And if I was hiring you, I would stop the video now. Like he might have watched 20 seconds of your reel. And he goes like, I'm already bored. Yeah. Um, really which, which, which I hope doesn't break any hearts, but <laughs> it can be kind of kind of straightforward, but in a good way. Yeah. That your reel needs to be short. If you have, if you only have one game, then show only that game. Um, 
you can't show two minute passages of you just walking about <laughs> because if it's the footsteps that is the, that is the cool thing in that sequence i need four of them it takes two seconds and that over um so more about let's say variety and showing that you you know your skills uh, more like and, and be just show that you're super creative i like um when i left uh io interactive and actually got hired by cd project red one of the things that i started to put into my own reel was videos where you see me code or you see me work in cubase you see me work in unity and so on because anyone, not any, but a lot of people can make a really nice sounding reel. But what we're actually looking for is someone who doesn't just say, oh, I can implement in Unreal. We, if someone shows it in the, in the reel, then they have just proven themselves-ish. Uh, I have previously in a job interview talk at one point mentioned that think about all the all the stupid questions and worries that a potential employer might have like, okay, I've seen your reel, but can he do unreal or can he unreal and real? Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, but can he do unity or can he this and that? So they, they have this list of doubts and questions that they might ask. And your job is to literally try and answer those before the job interview. Ooh. So if you do it correctly and, and the right way, you have literally answered all of them. So the job interview will basically be, uh, how are you today? Okay, good. Uh, yeah, that's it. Because they, they don't have to ask you uh, if you have a, if, if you have a situation with a first person shooter and you have to shoot people, how would you mix that? <laughs> but if you explain that in the real and, and, and the stuff that you showed, they don't have to ask you and they won't. Um, so kind of like, maybe I should even write that, but there's a list of weird stuff that they ask at job interviews. Like, how would you go about implementing something in Unreal? How would you go about doing something in Unity? Or if it's a custom engine, how would you treat um, sounds that are too loud in a game and cannot be compressed if you were to remix them all how would you go about that if you then have a video that shows that you can clearly batch convert to aes 128 or something something yeah, yeah, if you have a then, then that question is some completely irrelevant because you have already shown me that you can do so um so having let's say live content in your reel is not bad at all. Cool. I mean, I've uh, seen uh, one that was quite nice, and it was uh, as the reel was playing, it was uh, in, in the center of the gameplay with the sounds already implemented and finished. And the bottom right hand corner was then with the microphone recording the original sound. Yeah. And the top left hand corner was like the middleware project that being mixed and triggered and stuff like that. So you could sort of see the entire process. And, start yeah. in a full on sort of one screen. Yeah, that, that but nice that time. that could be one way of doing it. Of course, of course, not take the focus away from the actual sound mm. and from what you're supposed to see. But that kind of proves that you can even write it in text. The microphone is placed like this because we want a not too close mic situation. Okay, you've just proven that you know microphone placement. You've yeah. answered that question. Um and Maybe there's a screenshot of the mastering process or a, what, a two second video where you just, or five, ah, not just two, five, where mean. you say, okay, then we master all the sounds so they conform to the same level so that none of them um, stick out as odd or too loud or anything like that. And we've put it into the game and now it works like this. Okay, on to the next thing you want to show. But that's kind of like, it proves that you know what's going on. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be super technical. And if there's something that you can't do, then just don't do it. But if there's something that you can do, then then try yeah. and try and show that off too. Because we're not only as sound designers for video games, unless you're Richard Devine and all you do is content. 
and then we're we're looking for people who can implement stuff themselves and that's more than like you just heard um i haven't made a sound in a while only doing content only doing uh, systems and logic setups so that's part of the job it's like it's 50 percent of everything so so you have to kind of show that too yeah ish i mean you mentioned earlier about um certain things about you coding and stuff like that so in regards to the sort of i can't code but yeah <laughs> you, you say that but um just a side note that some of your audio programming for noobs in unity yeah helped me complete my master's project so oh, nice thank you for that thank and you I very much give you your name in the video <laughs> <as well. laughs> that was that was okay the, the, the funny part of that is that okay i'm not a programmer but the whole point is that that people who cannot code like me and you probably mm -hmm. um we are all uh because we look at code and it looks like black magic you know <laughs> fiery cauldron in the forest witch brew and some programmer does stuff but that's because we always when we see code we only see super advanced code mm. we we never look at something that does something extremely simple and the reason why I then made all those videos was simply because I've tried to be on productions where I asked programmers questions about, I need, I need a sound to play whenever I enter this area. How, how do I do that? And then they come up with some messed up long programmer explanation about namespacing and they have to communicate, send global events, and then we can pick up and then this... OK, but and that doesn't answer my question, because my question is super simple. How do I play a sound when I enter this room that the answer isn't all those things um, on trigger, enter <laughs> on trigger, enter play. Uh, and that's 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 super simple. And also, like I say in the video, it might not be the most efficient code, but it works. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it, it might not be what the programmer would do, but if you can do it yourself, that might help you a little bit of understanding how how is this going to work in the long run. Um, you feel it sort of helped you communicate a bit more and understand the language between yourself and programming. Totally, yeah. totally. Uh, I'm still not a programmer. I'm also a total noob at programming, but but it helped me communicate with programmers a lot more because it also helped me understand that when they say event. I'm thinking about a wise event and they are talk they are talking code events, which is a completely different thing. Um, and why is something private? Why is something public? I still haven't figured that out, but you sort of like understand that 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 something that is public can be edited by you. And as a designer, I want everything to be public because I just want to be able to tweak numbers. And programmers don't like that. Some do, but <laughs> Most go. programmers don't like that. They want everything to be internal and efficient and, uh, you know, space rocket science thing <laughs> for coding something simple. And it's really difficult. Um, yeah, especially if you look at the C++ code. Yeah. <laughs> have you tried? I don't know if you have that. <laughs> I've had a little look. <laughs> yeah, the, um, the, problem, the problem with C++ code is that you can... You can make these what's it called a, a pointers in memory that can contain other code. Mm. So literally, your entire game can just be one line of text that says, "I don't know, Q dollar one two uh, N U P," and then it triggers all those things in the memory, and you have no idea what that is. Oh, that would be my head in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've seen stuff like that. I go like, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in regards to these sorts of um, applications and frameworks, would you say that sort of learning a specific audio programming framework like Juice or something similar would be nah. beneficial or sort sort after skill? If you're if you're if if you're into coding, then sure. If you think you can use it for something creative, then yeah, I don't know how to work in Juice at all. What about applying to sort of uh, audio programming positions. If yeah, if you want to. If you want to work in audio programming positions, then you would probably be better off uh, understanding C sharp and C plus okay. plus. Uh, 
maybe take it a little further and then understand how DSP works internally. You know, you know I don't know if you ever heard two, two computer scientists discuss code, but um, <laughs> that's like insane rambling. Um, it doesn't have to be on that level, but, but, but if you want to program, if you want to code, then you have to know the languages else, else you have to just uh, agree with yourself that code is something that you learned because it made your life easier. It's not because you want to be a coder as such. Mm -hmm. So you said it's probably more beneficial uh, to be a little bit more patient to understand the underlying concept yeah. of projects in the end product. Um, yeah, because I I started to pick up just a little bit of code in C Sharp when I was working on a project. That was my school project. And I remember asking the programmer when I want a tool that when sound A plays, sound B is lowered in volume. That was before there was a live compressor in Unity. Uh, and I know that it's possible because you can just ask, um, this sound dot is playing. If that is true, do this. Um, mm -hmm. And I wanted a system that would be able to say, to set a check mark on one sound and say, if, if this sound plays, it does something. And then all the other sounds could then say, oh, a sound played, then I react in a certain way. And he kept asking me, why? <laughs> <laughs> and wh why do you want the volume to go down every time this sound plays? And I'm just, just in my head, I already know that it sounds awesome. <laughs> because for, for what I wanted. Um, and we had this system where, um, you know, I could mark, I could mark the jump sound. There was this uh, uh, sound that she made whenever she jumped. Um, I could just map that and then say, when this sound plays uh, for one second, which is the time it would take to jump, um, the... Um, the pitch of everything else goes down and comes back up. And he kept asking, why do you want that? <laughs> and then eventually I went home and then called my friend who's a programmer and he understands me. Uh, I mean, answers to life, he understands me. Um, he, uh, I asked him the same question and said, look, I, I want to be able to do these things. How do we do this step by step? I don't want you to construct the system. I want you to show me how it would be done. And then we made this thing that could pick up if the sound was playing and this other sound could respond if that sound was playing. And that resulted in, in a system that, that just it became two scripts, just you know, uh, audio trigger send and audio trigger listener. And you could just add them to any sound you wanted in the game. And then every time you, you, jump or you die, everything pitches down and goes back up and so on. And it became this really interactive system. And that was when I realized that that, that was a pretty advanced creative tool. And it took five minutes to code. <laughs> uh, and it wasn't it wasn't hard at all. And I was if I could do it myself in rough, really bad code, but working. I would rather do that than spend a whole day trying to explain a programmer why I want to do it. Um, and eventually I took over the audio code myself. And then only instead of being, instead of having a dedicated audio programmer asking why all the time, then I am now the programmer. And every time there's something that I can't do, I can always ask an overall programmer, how do I do? And then I can ask code related questions. I don't have to ask about the, the entire system anymore. Um, so understanding at least how code communicates is a massive advantage. Um, and, I, and I'm still not a coder at all. Um, yeah, so going through those processes, like you say, has definitely helped you be able to communicate yeah. your audio design ideas to yeah, or if, if you're not if, an audio person. Yeah, if, you, if you've worked with, I don't know, Max MSP or PD or something, mm -hmm. then... Uh, then you will clearly understand what signal path is, and that's exactly the same. Um, 
And learning those tools will help you understand when you talk to a programmer as well that I need to store this value. And when this over here happens, get this volume back or something. Um, it, it makes it really important to not be afraid of code and what happens under the hood. You might not be really good at it, but if you understand what can be done with it, then you're, you're way ahead of the pack. So cool. So just having that general awareness of what's going on. And yeah, exactly. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, um, no just moving on to some questions on your experience working in the sort of game audio industry. Yeah. Uh, we've got a couple of questions here. It's quite a good one. So uh, how do you get affected by the crunch and how do you deal with that pressure? Um, if the company pays me to crunch, I crunch <laughs> for a life. Um, almost. But I do also take very much pride in when, when the normal workday is over, I leave. Um, which is as it should be. Yeah. I mean, when, when the day is over, the, the problem with the game industry as a whole is that for quite a long time, you know, all the stories, it's been living off this whole everybody wants to work in games and everybody wants to work 90 hours a week uh, and so on. Um, that is that is a massive problem uh, because if you think about it, then it's the a company that hires people and expects them to crunch for free. They are literally making a product that they cannot afford to actually make. So they're getting double the time. So they're, they're literally only paying half of, it, of what it is. So when they come out and say, oh, it cost us $100 million to make this game. Yeah, but everybody worked double time. So technically it should have been 200. <laughs> um, but dealing with crunch is very much a question of uh, setting your own standard of how are you going to deal with this? Because I, I do believe in that this is this is also for the greater good but also in terms of the project that that if releases tomorrow then i also want it to sound good of course and if if it just it just needs that extra hour of polish i don't i don't blame anyone for me having long hours towards that the end of that day and finishing up wrapping it up because i like it yeah. um but no company shall tell me anything about mandatory crunch, <laughs> uh, which I have tried. Um, and it's, it's not nice and it's not fair, but the industry is changing. So, um, but we do work a little bit of odd hours. Like I said, if, if, if the game needs a little bit of an extra hand towards the end of this week, then crunch staying an extra hour is not crunching that's just you know putting a little in putting in that yeah, little yeah, effort if it's day yeah. to day every day crunching that's, that's too yeah the, the the there are out. there are stories of projects of people coming in at 8 8 a.m leaving at 9 p.m every day for a year <laughs> and when you do that you not only put your health at risk you're also severely underpaid. And if you don't speak up, you're part of the problem. If you have a wife, you will ex most 99% of the cases uh, be divorced very soon. And so on. And it causes all sorts of problems. And you're not meant to work like that. So you say it's good practice to, like you say, just uh, know, first of all, sort of your own boundaries, but also in regards to, you know, if you're being sort of paid nine to five, then generally around those hours they they yeah they work yeah i've i mean i at, at ccp it was pretty cool because that is also how it should be that we had we had this this art art uh producer no, art manager guy and he straight up said i don't care when you come to the office and i don't care when you leave but do not come later than 10 and do not leave before four Okay. And, and that's pretty straightforward because just if you come in at 6 a.m., uh, of course, of course, you could leave early. It's not that. But 
if you come in like normal people at eight, then you're off at four. If you yeah. come in at 10, you're off at six. And it was very straightforward that just have a nice attitude towards people. And then sometimes if something wasn't done on time, then, um, and I've, I've, used, I've talked back to people who act, demanded that they demand that, that, but it's not finished. You should, you should push more as like, no, the producer who set the time frame should be fired. Uh, be, well, not like that, but in, in an over exaggerated way that a producer who asks the question, how long is this going to take? And you say, it's going to take a month. And then he says, oh, but you get two weeks, but then it's not going to be done. Um, if you pay me double, then sure. Yeah. <laughs> but no, else no. Um, and I take very much pride in my work hours and my private life and doing sports and so on. And yeah, you don't have a life outside of work as well. Yeah, right? you really have to, and you're way more efficient, and your creativity will blossom yeah. yeah blossom if you if you if you if you take it easy yeah. um but anyway when the crunch is demanded it depends on how you're asked because look we're behind with this like um jazz doesn't have the time to finish this thing can you help out just a couple of hours on monday before release that, that's very fair and yeah. i don't mind um but it's it's more like I just dislike crunch. I dislike the industry for that part, really. Mm. Um, uh, you sort of mentioned sports and stuff like that. Do you do you ever practice breathing or meditation or you know diet? Uh, it's obviously quite an important thing with you know staying focused and energized. And... Uh, not like that, but I played golf. <laughs> no. <laughs> so that's it's kind of meditative, you know, long long walks and concentration. Yeah. But but. I, I don't practice breathing and I don't meditate, but I know some people who do mm -hmm. and it's, it's, they benefit immensely from, from let's call it a lack of stress. Yeah. <laughs> um, their work day is, is much, uh, much calmer um, than most others are. <laughs> and then uh, that might not be a sport, but, but practicing to work organized it's a thing. That's one of my biggest problems to, to be organized in any, any way. Um, but you have to force yourself to be so because then you will work much more efficiently. And that's also like with crunch. If you're super efficient in planning and so on, then I, you can probably get the work done in two thirds of the time you normally think you would. And then there's more time for golf. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> uh, um, um, I've seen sound designers and including myself spending a whole day doing something because we get distracted. We do other things and so on. But if there was a plan today, we have to do this and this and this, and then you can do it much faster. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Just being like, say, organized, trying to think ahead a little bit and create yeah. things in place to try and reduce that crunch time if and when it does come down. Yeah. And then of course, it, it is the game industry and I'm not endorsing it for using crunch, but it is the game industry and you're, you're working with it products, tight deadlines and something creative. Um, working, working over time is not the same as crunching um, as such. I just dislike it when, when it's expected of you to put in insane amount of hours and to get something done because that's bad planning on someone else's part. Sure. Yeah. So in regards to sort of working, like you say, you, you were talking about working on smaller projects and then moving up to bigger projects. Um, what would you say is that like, what, how, how drastic and what are the sort of limitations of your creative freedoms that you have to face when you work as a sound designer in these bigger projects in comparison to smaller projects? It depends, but uh, usually, usually you're given a task, and unless, of course, it's something specific like fully recording, as I said before, then normally you take the task and you go to your desk, and nobody cares how you do it. 
So there is usually full creative freedom. Maybe there are some directional guidelines in terms of uh, uh, everything below 20 hertz must be cut off. Maybe there are some, some rules. Uh, everything must run through this processing chain or be to this level and so on. And that is fair. But apart from that, nobody cares. <laughs> as long as you get the yeah. result. You get the result. Does yeah. it sound does it sound good? Yeah, yes or no? That is the end question, and nobody cares how you got there. <laughs> I mean, what do you how do you feel about the changes in game audio since you started? The the way that middleware works now and like wise fmod, etc. Yeah. Uh, really changed a lot. It also changed the job description because previously yeah. you would you would be designing sounds and being old school craftsmen that would that would just create content and then that would go in somehow. Um, but now now that that uh, implementation is part of the job, implementation is also part of the design process. Um, so whenever I have to design a sound, then I, uh, my job has changed from just trying to make a cool sound to now think about, oh, I can create these layers and I can randomize this and it can play as this sequence. And then I can make these 1000 variations of this gunshot using four samples or something, um, uh, which is very much just if let's say efficiency thought into the sound design process and not only not only just sounds you would say um and that that has changed very much i think it, it changed it changed in a short time of me studying from 2014 to, to 18 when i first introduced the wise integrating projects involved copying hierarchies of folders and into unity projects and stuff and then obviously yeah. the, the pickers come out and you just click integrate and it yeah and then, and then it works like oh oh yeah. kids today they have it yeah. so easy <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but it, it's 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 kind of it's, okay it's not that it's easier today because now there's just more to do yeah like like um maybe the basics are easier to do but that just means that now that the basics are easier and faster to do everything else needs to be better yeah. um so i don't think in that regard not much has changed it's just that now it's not just about sound sound design for video games is a craft of logic systems and other things oh. and and the same as with code don't be afraid of logic systems because it's it's not in terms of having to create advanced systems. It's more thinking about, you know, treating a video game as interactive art, almost like an art installation. Someone does something and this sound over here randomizes something. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, actually. Yeah. Uh, I just got a question that came in. Um, is it more important to focus on your own sonic aesthetic strengths, such as drum shots or something that's glitchy, uh, and then companies hire you based on your strengths? or to be able to mold yourself to a project such as showing that you can produce any sort of sound? Um, you have to adapt to the, um, the current audio direction that's being given, yeah. which can be quite, it can be both fun, but also super difficult because if you, like me, like very heavy emphasis on, on low end and overproduced loud stuff and booms and thuds and very aggressive stuff. If somebody wants you to make something that's super quiet and uh, almost takes you to another level, birds and wind, um, then I don't find that necessarily difficult to do, but that's a completely different mindset. Um, and I have I have to adapt to the situation that this is how my director wants it to sound. It's not that difficult to adapt to it, but you have to understand that you you are now working with and for another person. You're not at home in your own studio doing whatever you please. And and it it, it is an honor to um, like take a little bit of, of pride in the fact that 
oh, I can create any sound. I'm not limited to my own stubbornness of what I want to do. Um, because I, I know a lot of sound designers, including myself, who are quite stubborn about, oh, I don't care about bird sounds. Yeah, but bird sounds are, is what is required now. Um, <laughs> and if, if you have the freedom to sit at home and do whatever you want, then either you won the lottery or you have made a massive hit or something like that, because you, you work with others as a team to create something, so. Yeah, you have those skills. Yeah, you, you have to, else you'd be fired pretty quick, <laughs> but yeah. Awesome. Cool, we've got, we got about 10, 10, 15 minutes left, so there's some sort of general questions here. Sure. Um, what sort of projects um, that you are not working on are interesting or exciting to you and why? Uh, it's a bit of a tricky one, I guess, because due to the lockdown, because I am working on the cool oh, yeah. projects on the planet. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I would very much someday be able to write on my resume that I worked for Bethesda and Naughty Dog. <laughs> nice. Um, so Last of Us Three and <laughs> let's say Starfield and, and um, Elder Scrolls. Um, the reason why I would like to work on those games is because I think the way that Naughty Dog treats their games as, not as a film, but, but as in that type of game and that level of production, I think is extremely honorable to be able to work on. And when it comes to Starfield, Fallout, um, and Elder Scrolls, those games are game franchises that I admire. They are some of the most important games around that has been, and the future of these games is definitely still defining how things will be. Mm. Um, and some of the things they have put in, in terms of audio, um, especially the Bethesda guys, but <laughs> until Skyrim, it was one guy, which is insane, but um, all the stuff that Mark put in, the guy at, at, at Bethesda, in terms of details and wind and all sorts of things, that is uh, something that has been pretty groundbreaking to me and helped me get a lot of ideas. So that would be probably some of the projects I would like to work on. I would just like to say thank you so much, Bjorn. Hey, you're very welcome. It's been fun uh, and nice yeah. chat. Yeah, it's great. Great chatting to you. Um, it was great seeing you and getting to know an inside Likewise. sort of perspective on these things. Likewise. Hopefully this COVID thing will be over yeah. soon so I can actually go to Bristol and do talks again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Or somewhere else, doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, out of the house. <laughs> yeah, out, out, just out of my house. <laughs> See other things than the supermarket and my house. That uh, would be nice. So I will say goodbye for now. Thank all you right. very much again. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank and, you all uh, at the yeah, team. Yeah, we'll be in touch, hopefully, and we'll get you in person. Cool. Cheers, everybody.